Welcome. Welcome everyone to our session today. Um, today we're talking about how together CETA and Indicio Tech utilized Hyperledger Aries, URSA, and Indy to create a secure travel credential that can be accepted by airlines, hotels, and hospitality partners without having to share any private health information. In fact, last month, CETA announced the successful trial of the Aruba Health Privacy app. It uses blockchain and the app creates a secure travel credential that's exposed um, without sharing that information. And so we're gonna be talking about that further today. Hello and welcome. Welcome to Paving the Way to a Safer Travel Experience. I'm Heather Dahl, I'm CEO of Indicio, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. First, let's have our two panelists introduce themselves. Adrian, why don't you begin? Sure, thank you, Heather. So welcome, everybody. Okay, uh, well, I'll take over. Why don't we, we take a minute to do some introductions while Heather's rejoining and um, I'll start since I'm already talking. Um, I work for Indicio as a VP of operations, but I wear a lot of hats. And one of the, the um, heaviest hats I wear is that of education. So I spend quite a bit of time um, talking to our clients and customers um, as they come to us to solve for their um, various identity and data uh, problems about verifiable credentials and decentralized identity and uh, trying to distill down the, the essence of the technology and uh, apply it to a particular use case and so that we can realize some value very quickly. So uh, that was the role that I filled uh, largely in this project was talking with um, uh, the folks in Aruba more than anything because Adrian and Sia are uh, intimately familiar with the technology, but uh, uh, translating some of the, the very complicated um, terms and, and making them uncomplicated so that they can see see value in a very um, to stand up project. So Adrian, why don't we let you sure. Thank you, Scott. So, um, yeah, as you mentioned, so, um, well, I'm uh, Adrien Sanglier, so I'm a program manager at the, the CETA Lab. So CETA Lab is a research group, uh, part of CETA company. So um, CETA is um, the main IT provider uh, of the air travel industry. Uh, so we are between uh, airport, airlines and governments. Um, you might uh, do not, well, you, you do not know us because we are mainly behind the scenes when you, when you travel, but uh, Let's say it is the infrastructure behind, uh, let's say, um, the ecosystem so that makes sure that um, necessary data is exchanged well between uh, all stakeholders. Uh, can be from, from passenger processing to baggage management or air traffic messages or, or even um, electronic travel authorization. So um, um, I work mainly in digital identity. Um, it is a key area of focus for industry. Um, it because we are looking at, at, at a real seamless passenger journey. Um, when you think about the number of times you have to show your passport, your data, your visa, and, and now your health status when you, when you travel, uh, th there is, uh, let's say, a room for improvement in our, in our industry. So um, it is our uh, focus of our work um, at CETA because we are also 100% uh, well, uh, committed to the industry uh, as per our, our structure. Uh, and this is why we, we undertook that, that, that project with, uh, with, with Indicio. So um, I see Heather, you, you could uh, join us back. I, I think I'm here. Can you hear me as well? Yes. We oh, well, we right? have a winner. We have a winner. That's great. That's great. <laughs> so so we, we've done some introductions, Heather, uh, for Adrian and myself. And uh, yeah. so we'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sticking and hanging on there with us as we go through these glitches that we get with uh the virtual world, but soon we'll see each other in person, hopefully this fall at the next uh, Hyperledger event in Seattle. Um, so I'm thinking, Adrian, a good place to begin is actually with you, because this all this all started with a call from CETA um, very early in the pandemic. Adrian, why don't you talk to us about the very beginning and explain the problem that you were seeking to solve? Sure. So it was uh, some some months back, and uh, when we think, well, it was uh, the very, well, not the beginning, but the middle of the pandemic, really, and um, and we were thinking at uh, yeah, how can the travel industry recover because it was really a tough moment for for the for the whole activity, uh, and uh, well, 
a lot of controls uh, further to, to border uh, checks were, were, were in place. Um, so many driven by health ministries. And um, we quickly realized we need exchange of data, uh, of course, because we're talking about health data. Uh, and um, we've seen it from the pandemic. We, we clearly um, uh, seen the limit of using paper documents, uh, paper certificates that can be easily uh, forged or faked, and, and also issues related to efficiencies when, when, when the, the activity um, picks up again, uh, the, the airport won't handle uh, such, uh, let's say, another security line. So um, how can we go digital in exchanging this data, which is extremely sensitive because we're talking about health, and how can border can, can reopen? So that was really the, the main problem. Um, and outlining it uh, a little bit deeper, it means that we need secure and verifiable data uh, for governments to reopen their borders. Um, but also, if you see it from a passenger, passenger standpoint, um, for adoption of, uh, of, of, of health data exchange, we, it needs to be privacy preserving, of course, uh, because you don't want to, uh, to give away your, your your, your, your health data um, without knowing, you know, uh, how to control it, let's say, and with, without consent. And, and finally, part of the problem was also scalability, uh, because we are a global industry. We, we need to move all at the same pace. Um, so that's really why we, we looked into decentralized identity models and especially verifiable credentials. Well, I also want to welcome those who are joining us in progress. Um, about how you can pave the way to safer travel. We're joined by Scott Harris of Indicio and Adrian over at CETA. Um, for those joining, this is an open conversation, so just jump in and put your questions in the chat screen on the right side of your window. So Scott, I'm gonna go to you next. And can you talk to us about how Indicio approached solving the problem that Adrian presented and also mapping it with the overall goal of the industry using the decentralized identity model. And then really, how did you model a workflow that would solve a problem like this? Okay, uh, th that's, uh, that's a lot of questions. I'll try to cover everything. Uh, but, but as I mentioned in my intro, uh, we really wanted to focus on um, simplicity in this case because uh, to try to solve for everything at, at once was not only daunting, but time consuming. And there's a great need to, um, to present something that's usable uh, quickly. Now, it needs to be presented, usable, have usability, but also, of course, have um, clients and have, um, you know, exist in the regulatory environment and, and make it work for everybody. So, so, uh, so we went back to the very basic four principles of decentralized identity, and that is putting the data in the hands of the traveler. And as Adrian said, um, that involves giving them control, protecting their privacy, so they're not having to share health data. And and we really looked at, uh, at the very simple uh, trust triangle that we use all the time to, to go through our education. Um, and I know you have a slide for that coming up. Yeah, uh, to, to, I don't sure know if you that. can, I think you can do that while I'm talking, that yeah. might be helpful. Can you can you see it there? Not quite yet. There we go. Right. So so we the idea here is that the, the traveler who's central to this operation um, and this architecture um, takes control of health data from a source um, that has issued them a verifiable credential, and there's a direct relationship then between those two parties. The traveler then establishes a relationship with a verifier or a receiver of the data. And there's a direct relationship there. So in doing that and, and using this model, this model that's been around for as long as decentralized identity has been around, uh, there's no need to stand up things like third party process, rules, engines, trust registries, all of that. It's really about trust between um, three uh, parties, three stakeholders. And if we could establish that trust um, with a, a data source that the verifier will trust, a data source used by the credential holder, and um, and establish that first, and we could we could build to that. So that's how we, we sort of map that um, relationship, and it's a very um, very quick and easy way to look at it solving for a problem. Um, and of course, as you bring more stakeholders and more 
uh, participants into it, you need to consider their interests and their compliance issues and their reg regulatory requirements and, and things like that. But uh, just to, to make this work in Aruba, it was a, a matter of talking to the, the participants that were participating. Uh, to forgive that phrase, um, but but I think it illustrates really the, the approach that we took. Um, so so this approach mapped well with uh, the government of Aruba's uh, idea of what they needed because it allowed them to identify data that they could trust, um, protect the privacy of the traveler, but still give them the autonomy and control of deciding what uh, what data to take from that traveler, and then ultimately what action to to take based upon that data. So as opposed to some other models where, where data goes to a, a processor or a rules engine or a, through a trust framework, and the decision may be made um, on the behalf of a verifier. Here we give the verifier complete control to, to take what they need, don't take what they don't need, protect privacy, and then get back on the data. Well, I think, you know, it's important to take a moment to focus on one of the key challenges, or in fact, I think for decentralized identity benefits. Um, Adrian, I know that one of the things CETA tries to do is deploy technology without totally disrupting existing enterprise or government processes. Um, talk to us a bit about why this decentralized identity model that Scott just set out here is actually helpful in this regard, especially when it comes to architecture. And I can show a slide um, here that might be able to help you explain a bit about it, Adrian. Sure. So the the, the big, let's say, um, uh, characteristic of, of the industry, it is that, well, they are like complex ecosystems. Uh, we do have the airline, the airport, and the governments uh, on a border crossing uh, use case. So airline will operate the route, uh, airports will provide uh, typically a shared environment or common use environment, uh, especially on international flights, and government will, will well have their own set of rules. So um, we need um, to, to properly design an architecture that, will, uh, that would fit the, the purpose of, of really border crossing. Uh, we need to envision all benefits of stakeholders. And um, as I said, we need exchange of data, and it's a lot of data to be to be exchanged when you, you cross a border behind the, behind the scene. Um, so the, where the, the technology uh, or the model really helps, it is about um, removing the need to establish point-to-point -point connections. Um, and as I said, complex ecosystems make also the, um, the, the that those ecosystems are evolving across time. Uh, so that, that's a major benefit we see uh, from that, that, uh, uh, that, that model. It, it, is, it, it, is must, uh, it simplifies uh, how to set up uh, the, those exchanges of data, but also how to maintain them uh, across time. Um, there is also another great benefit from it is, is how can you uh, shift liability uh, from um, from an airline to uh, to the government because um, right now in, in the model so um, airline is, is bringing people from, from A to B um, but they, they should also uh, um, enforce uh, rules uh, set out by governments uh, and they become also a broker of information that can be very sensitive and and, uh, and also um, uh, very difficult to handle um, so if we can enable that conversation between the individual the traveler and the government, uh, that's also a, a major improvement to the industry. Um, so we are not changing the way the data is exchanged, of course, uh, uh, and the same data will, will flow to the, to the government, to the airline, to the, to the passenger, but simplify how ecosystems are created and managed. So it is about providing well, different kind of pipes for that uh, exchange of information to, to, to proceed. So, that, so that, that's the main help. Yeah, so I'm going to stick with you, Adrian. You know, with that in mind, can you talk a bit how a, a sovereign government or a nation or even a commercial enterprise for this case goes about selecting the type of solution that they're looking for for the exchange of data without a direct inter integration? Of course, consent is very important. And in this case, how did you see hyperledger is a key part to being important in making your decision? 
Right. So the, the key, um, let's say, principle is um, when, when managing ecosystems, is it should be easy to join the party, <laughs> in a sense. Uh, you should be able to uh, uh, to just be able to well submit your data, receive also, and, and make sure, you know, uh, again, as everyone should see uh, the, the, the benefits. That should be done on a scalable way. Um, we should also understand how the ecosystem is controlled and the underlying technology too. And it should be absolutely open. So all those characteristics, we found them in, in, in Hyperledger, Ursa, Ares, and, and, and Indy. Um, and, well, and also the, the one goal very important um, as a consequence of all, all of the above is, of course, interoperability. It can be open when, it, when the, the technology provides interoperability. And as it is well, open source, it is uh, developed by the community, um, we know there will, there will be ways to, um, to support and, and, and talk to any other uh, digital identity uh, mechanism, models, uh, other networks or technology that, will, that exist today or will exist in the future. So that's also a, a bet in the future uh, when we, uh, we, we let's say, uh, use uh, Hyperledger as our technology stack. And, and as I said, there's no one solution for the global industry. So it's very important to be uh, forward looking. And, and Scott, what are your thoughts here as you were applying what we call business logic to the actual technology ecosystem? Yeah, I, Heather, I think the, um, the, the important thing here is that uh, as, as Adrian has described, it's a very complex system of exchanging data. And the goal is not to, um, not to supplant the, those systems or change them because they're they're well established and 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 contain um, you know long-standing agreements between parties uh, about what they need and what they take and how things happen. So our goal here was to use the hyperledger-based tools and and verifiable credentials as a way of building um, additional trust into the system such that um, so the data can be shared. At a very early stage in the passenger journey, and and shared in a trusted manner all the way to the end, and, and thus smooth the system. So, uh, while we started out here with with uh, you know health data and COVID credentials and things, it's always been with an eye on the big picture that there's more there's more to it than than just that. We were you know, solving the immediate problem that was at hand, but but there's a big And for those of you who are joining us in progress, welcome. We're talking about paving the way to safer travel with Indicio and CETA. You can join our conversation. Just uh, post a message in the chat on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll incorporate you into our conversation. So Adrian, what I found most interesting about the trial in Aruba, and actually what I found was probably the most exciting part of this, is that you had a traveler who could share their medical information digitally without a direct database integration between the issuing laboratory at the hospital and the government of Aruba. And they were able to do that with full consent and transparency behind the sharing of that information. Can you talk to us from where you are sitting today about how interoperability and health data work together, knowing that you gone through quite a journey on this in the past year and thinking about it. Sure. So um, the first challenge we had, I think, in front of, of our, our eyes was uh, how do we represent uh, health data? Um, wh what it is, um, I mean, health data can be really represented in multiple ways, and there are a lot of different data schemes out there. And we need, still need to exchange them, um, and not only the data, and in that case, also the metadata that would describe how, uh, how this credential would look like. So um, um, this is all another big advantage of decentralized identity. You can exchange also metadata. Um, so um, we, we needed to pick a technology uh, to support our use case that enables that, that level of standardization uh, to, the, to the data. So um, um, again, uh, I think um, Aries and Indy uh, were providing this in a very efficient way. Um, and in a sense, a proprietary standard wouldn't work uh, because, as I said, it's, it is about organizing ecosystems. So um, that's all, also the, the reason why we are looking at open source community and, 
And, and this is, you know, in, in the story, and we've seen that how efficient it was, is it, it was, uh, well, Indicio helped us to, um, to, to build the necessary pieces and also raise the voice of CETA into the community. Uh, and, and, and also the other way around, we, we could also understand uh, what it takes to, uh, to use, well, Hyperledger uh, pro project and, and, and technology. Um, so it was, I think it started with taking a look at what's, what was possible, what was not, um, and, and building a simple demonstrator uh, out of the, of the code in the, in the repos and, and we created a lot of, of visuals and, and socialized it with stakeholders. Um, so, um, looking back, there's a lot of value, of course, in, in education also, because uh, that's, uh, uh, that's a change, that's a change of the way uh, the information would be, would be uh, shared. And um, as we said, it, the, those ecosystems are very fragmented uh, because there are multiple health requirements, multiple government and requirements, and the airline process and the, the, the airport process. I think. Um, providing that level of standardization both in data processing and technology was, was absolutely key uh, to the success of our, of our project. So it, it makes me think, you know, when you started 2020, I don't think you anticipated working as closely with the healthcare industry as you actually did. What was the one or two lessons that you learned or that were maybe even surprising to you working so closely with healthcare partners? So uh, I would say um, it, it, it was not uh, about um, um, uh, the, the technology, uh, how, do we, uh, how do we ask them to integrate, uh, I don't know, uh, an, an ARIES wallet or ARIES development, but it was still about providing standard technology that, we, uh, that they are used to, of course, uh, in the end of the day, it's, it's, it's data that will li likely stand on a central database anyway for the, the matter of, of, of processes. Um, so um, it, it became just a standard IT project. Um, so working with healthcare has been um, it became it became a, an IT project. It was no magic, I would say, in integrating credential. It was about defining the, the, the specification again. What it is a, a PCR test re, re, a result? What it is a, a vaccine or even a declaration of, of uh, secondary effects? And, um, and people were, were very enthusiastic about, uh, let's contribute to the, to the, the industry recovery also. Uh, so travel is one, but also the, the economy is uh, in, in a whole. And, and, um, and see um, uh, how can we leverage that uh, privacy uh, perspective of, uh, of the decentralized identity model uh, for, the, um, for the advantages of, of the interest of, of, of privacy, of course, which is very important for the healthcare industry. Heather, can I, can I add something to that as well? Uh, I think we, we've talked, we've mentioned the, the I word interoperability here. And um, I think that's an, an important piece of this because once we established with uh, the government, government of Aruba, the, um, you know, the value props of privacy protection, data control and autonomy and all of the things we, we talked about, the next question was, well, you know, how do we build from here, right? Um, and so interoperability is key. How do they integrate the next health system and the next health system and the next health system in order to continue to take credentials from a wider set of um, participants? And, and how do they take these into their you know, internal system and create derivative credentials from the data they receive? So, so making things interoperable is, is incredibly important. And it's even more important to frame that interoperability word in context because we have a very uh, rapidly changing technology sector here, and um, many claims can be made about interoperability. You know, if you're on a proprietary platform, for example, uh, you could easily say that that's interoperable, but the context is as long as everybody comes and plays, pays for our proprietary system, of course it's interoperable. Uh, so, so that's where the, the Hyperledger um, tools come into play and the open source ecosystem comes into play where um, we want to make sure that uh, the stakeholders have the ability as they come to participate as, as adrian said we want to make it easy for people to come to the party um, that that their things can work together or if they want something slightly different it can be built to work together um, so so our philosophy here is, is not 
necessarily that, to use an analogy of putting together puzzle pieces, because there's only one way that a puzzle can fit together, uh, but rather than let's, let's build the bricks that, that can make something. Let's build Lego blocks that can go together to, to build the things that everybody needs and make them very universally useful um, in order to achieve interoperability. So that's been a big piece of the, uh, the education here to say it, it, they seem easy, to just write a check and pay and have somebody else do it. And, and there will be people who take that path. Um, but in terms of scalability and long-term um, viability, this building block approach seems much more sustainable. Well, and I think when you talk about derivative credentials and the building block approach, we're really talking about this ecosystem. And sometimes the concept of ecosystem maybe gets lost um, in the words about exactly what this ecosystem was and that it scaled quite a few parties. And that CETA and Adicio had to meet the interest and also benefit every single stakeholder in this ecosystem, no matter what role they played. And so what, what I'm gonna show is actually a video um, that we put together with CETA and the original purpose of this video was to actually teach verifiers on the island for the trial. But what we found was that education across the entire ecosystem. This animated video turned out to be one of the most valuable education tools that we had. And so um, if everything works uh, the way we want it to, I hope that I can share this. So I will play it and see what happens. I'm sure this video brings back plenty of memories. Um, from where oh, yeah. you sit today, what do you think after watching that again here? It's been a while since you've watched it, so. Yes, yes, I mean, uh, it's of course lots of emotions, yeah, um, because a long, a long way and it was really a windy road to get there, <laughs> not, uh, not a straight line at all. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it reminds me again, you know, uh, that uh, the time and energy it took to, to really, uh, I think, onboard people and, and make them understand, you know, that uh, 
they are in the center of everything. Each party is at the center of, of, of the, 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 the fact that, well, it can work with, with, with everyone. So um, that's, I think, um, the, the, the key takeaway. Scott? You haven't seen this uh, for a while. What, to, what do you same, think? Same question. No, I, I think uh, the interesting point there in this whole thing is that uh, I'll go back to the original trust triangle is that uh, once data interests them in a way that, that it can be trusted, as opposed to um, some of the problems such as passing paper around or scanning and faxing PDFs or emailing JPEGs of, of things. So once data enters the system in a way that it can be trusted, we see that it has all kinds of uses. And, and as you mentioned, derivative credentials, such as this Happy Traveler card, can be issued and then subsequently trusted. So um, it, it's an ecosystem that, that builds on itself because um, you know, the initial intake point, the KYC, the, the work that was done to, to put trust in the system can be um, utilized downline to provide value to all sorts of uh, entities that, that might not have even understood that they could get value from that. So that's, that's my feeling on it. It really, really shows the power of all of this. And for those of you who just joined us, we're talking about paving the way to save for travel with CETA and Indicio. You too can be a part of the conversation. Just join us in the chat on the right-hand side of the screen. So, Scott, we saw the video, and if uh, participants want to go to CETA's LinkedIn page, there's actually a video that shows uh, people participating in the trial using the Aruba Health Privacy app, going to a casino so they can see it work in real time. And then you have, you know, the press release, but I think sometimes all the you know unveiling and the, the public relations it, it it obscures the hard work and exactly what this looked like when it started <laughs> and so i feel it's really important for our audience and for people interested as you said adrian this was a long and windy road this was not easy and so i want to bring up a blast from the past here and share it I think Scott will especially love this picture. Um, this um, is, <laughs> yes. This, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, this is actually, you saw, the, you saw the animated video. This is what started it all, was this sketch. Um, and yeah, it's not pretty packaged, animated, produced. But here it is. This was the slide that started it all on the architecture. Does it does it look familiar, Scott? Well, well, vaguely, but it, it, you know, this was a learning process for all of us. I mean, not not just uh, around health data, but around how to, uh, as I mentioned in my intro, that, that you weren't here for Heather. That the big a big effort is put into educating people who aren't, uh, you know, uh, hyperledger aficionados or Aries. Uh, toolbox users and things. So to take something like this, which I still have to squint at a little bit, make it make it into something um, understandable and usable and presentable, and then turn it into a, a demonstration product is a long and winding road. So um, we've learned a lot, and and um, we're still learning, right? So I think everybody was learning a year ago about how do we how do we even solve for medical data in a pandemic and and I would argue that it's still not been solved. Um, countries like Aruba are, are probably far ahead of other countries. You know, I know what I know what's going on in the U.S. And there's no, you know, there's very little in the way of digital initiatives to handle this sort of stuff. So it's still a learning process for everyone. Um, but but yeah, what I learned was. Um, was taking this this little diagram and breaking it down even further is is what worked so that that's grassroots building block, block approach because when you look at something like this you can easily let your mind wander to okay i see one provider there what happens when i have 50 providers what happens when i have a thousand providers uh, what happens when i have a hundred thousand individuals and 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 all these verifiers and how do we get them all to agree on governance how do we get them degree on what's trusted and what's not and how do we get it can in 
pretty easily, you know, devolve into a, a, a mud pit where nobody can get out, right? You just get trapped. Um, and I think we've seen some of that happening um, with some of the initiatives that that it can get overly complicated. So what what I learned um, and what we still try to do at Indicio is take that grassroots approach and, and go, let's just, let's use these great Hyperledger based uh, tools that we have and these open source um, agents that, that are based on those tools to make some bricks and use those bricks to build a building. And then we can open the door and let people come in. And if they want to build an addition on our building that looks architecturally different, but it but the two still connect and we can go back and forth, then then we've had a big win, right? So so that's what we've learned is to just break it down and um, and start small. I know and Adrian I can talk quite a bit more about the journey because it, it has been a, a fun and interesting road, but uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Heather. Yeah, Adrian, I know when I showed this blast from the past that you uh, chuckled a little bit because this uh, probably brought back even earlier memories. Um, but maybe you can use this uh, very, I would say, maybe even first iteration of a slide to start talking about the challenges um, that you overcame along the way to, uh, to deploying a successful trial. Sure, absolutely. And, and maybe I'll start um, with, a, with a question from Guillermo I see on the, on the Q&A, because that's, that's really one of the, the challenge we have also is how do we incentivize people to use the app? Um, and and that's a, that's a very good point. You know how CETA has been encouraging you know participants to use mobile apps because there are mobile apps everywhere and most of them can be standalone. So um, um, first, well, for, for airlines, clearly um, it is the ability to um, uh, just to do a simple check, uh, and it's uh, of course um, uh, much uh, faster than reviewing paper documents and and going through the details of uh, for this destination do i have to do I have to check you know this questionnaire or uh, the pcr test results which kind of requirements um, and we eliminate all of this by just a pass that has been issued by the government so now of course um, it's going to be a, a standalone app um, it's not it's not perfect yet it, the the idea is also to provide now sdks or even even better um, well, so SDKs, so that it can be uh, integrated into an existing app used by the airline agent at, at boarding or, or check-in. But what we are looking at now is how do we incorporate those verification re um, re requirements into um, an automated boarding gate or a, a check-in kiosk. Um, and this is, this is being done. So um, we also need to move away from standalone mobile apps and, and provide automation. Um, so that's for airline. Now, government, well, um, they won't be using a mobile app as such, but uh, a dedicated interface, because I think government also need to, uh, to, to have a view on how many credentials do we, can I, uh, did I issue um, to, to allow my, my, my residents or visitors to, uh, to allow them in, in the country. Um, so there are also um, a set of reporting uh, requirements that we need to fulfill. So uh, in that case, web application is clearly more and more suited for that. And, and users, um, so um, as I said, for, for, for this project, it was standalone, but the, the incentive is, is quite easy. Um, is, is about, well, uh, cut the, the, the lines on, on arrival. Um, and um, there are, we're also looking at technologies that, um, that enable us to integrate to uh, any existing app and only provide the wallet in a very transparent way. So I think that's also a way to encourage uh, adoption uh, when it comes to really uh, mobile, mobile applications. And it's a real problem with, uh, of today. Um, yeah, so going back to other challenges that we, 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 uh, we had, well, clearly, and we, we said it, is, is how do we uh, uh, provide inclusion? You know, how do we uh, include everyone into the conversation about, um, about setting up the ecosystem? Uh, because every voice has equal importance. Uh, it's like a UN session. <laughs> uh, you need to be... Uh, uh, to include everyone, and, and the outcome will, will will happen only when everyone will agree on uh, base of a consensus. So, um, for example, I mean, um, as a as a lab uh, testing a clinical lab, if you can issue a credential or, or government a health pass, but if no one is able to verify it, it it's quite pretty useless. So, um, but also if you can you can issue a PCR test result, but if no government is gonna back it or vet it, it's gonna be worthless. So. Um, 
So um, in sitting a bit, it, it is about um, uh, putting everyone at the table and, and, and investing in this time uh, front, of course, before the IT project really uh, happens, uh, to onboard everyone. And, and how did we do that? Well, uh, open source, open standard, uh, like uh, Hyperledger is, of course, was, was key, uh, really, on, on, the, on the dialogue. Um, and but also the collaboration, a very strong collaboration with healthcare state sector. Um, so uh, how to best describe a PCR test, a vaccine, um, is, is what we need to make sure you know everyone can can, can see interest uh, in, in providing you know uh, uh, effort to it and having that standard that everyone needs uh, to uh, streamline the process. So uh, we took really the, the most open data schema. Uh, the, 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 and uh, and uh, again, you know, um, collaborating uh, with um, with healthcare sector, pharmaceutical of uh, different sizes, different culture, different maturity levels was uh, was I think um, a, a very good lesson learned. Was was, uh, was a clear advantage to us uh, in that uh, in that process. So Scott, every mile, every marathon comes down to the last mile. What was one of the challenges that you had to overcome in the last mile of? this project heading into the trial? <laughs> just, you want me to pick just one? Um, hmm. th there were there were many. Um, heading into the trial, I, I think the, um, the challenge is still centered around um, uh, education for me on my side of the, the equation, uh, meaning uh, as more and more people began to participate to actually make this happen. And I mean, uh, people outside of, um, outside of Indicio and, and outside of CETA, uh, you know, for our actual passengers, for our actual, um, you know, government officials and things, going and demonstrating this, this capability for them and then, then being, able, being able to explain it again um, in a way that, that allowed them to see the value of it. So, because it doesn't present itself as a traditional um, solution, right? It doesn't, it's, as I said, it's not a, you know, buy this software and install it and then everything runs. It, it's, you, you know, it does require participation from all of the different stakeholders in order to make it work for them. And sometimes that's a, that's a harder uh, thing to communicate the value of. Um, and I, then I think the other piece of it was um, trying to understand the next steps right and communicate that to everyone and, and i was i apologize for stepping on adrian earlier i wanted to, to to mention on the topic of um wallets and apps and incentivizing and things like that i think the um standalone app is one way to go and and it certainly um in this case it, to to start simple and build simple and demonstrate value uh but term um, long-term use it needs to be more than that right it needs to be more than just a single point solver it needs to be integrated and live somewhere else so um, Aruba has a, a, a really nice app that they built for their um, for their residents and travelers and our goal was to um, you know mimic that and allow them to see that this could just be part of what they already have in existence so for any other um, enterprise type of implementation, the idea is not necessarily this, um, you know, Aries-based uh, credential wallet exists on its own and we have to tell somebody to go use this one or that one. The idea is that, that it should be interoperable with others and, and if it exists inside their their existing app environment, um, it can work that way. So, so to me, that was a, a big part of the challenge because we were asked, uh, or I was asked repeatedly, you know, do we have to use, do our people have to use this app all the time? Right. And, and that's a long winded answer to that question, but, but the answer is no. And, and probably in my mind, they shouldn't, they should be using, you know, whatever app you're already using and, and this capability should be wrapped up into it. Well, I think education is a really important part. Both uh, CETA and Indicio are committed to education around decentralized identity. And that's why we're having this conversation Day at Hyperledger, and we're being open about our experiences because we want to help educate and let others who may be considering similar projects for maybe different use cases to understand some of the challenges and the, the road that we went down um, to help inform what they're developing. I want to take a couple minutes to talk around governance, Adrian. 
and um, the role governance played with this, and also the introduction, in this case, we introduced machine-readable governance as well um, to help facilitate the exchange and acceptance of those credentials. Um, Adrian, what was the approach that CETA took um, around governance for the trial in Aruba? Right, so um, you're right. Uh, I mean, the, the, the governance is extremely important when you look at organizi organizing those ecosystems. And um, our approach was uh, to, to focus on separating what we call the trust and the data. Um, and we, we've seen that it is consistent with recent discussions also on, on other health passes and, and, uh, and what we, we hear also on more global initiatives. So, um, um, what I mean is the, the health pass is de derived from health data. Uh, the health data is uh, so your vaccines, your maybe your secondary effect, your your, your questions or or your PCR test result, and from this um, a set, um, an authority party will uh, will issue uh, the, the pass, and the pass would not contain any private data, and this is what you would present. Um, to different verifiers, such as a uh, restaurant or shop or, or hotel or, or, any, or even a, a touristic venue. So um, that's, that's, that's really important because when we presented our approach um, of, of, and the technology, the model of decentralized identity model, uh, that question was raised immediately by Aruba is, is how do I control that pass? Um, and because, well, as Aruba, I, I need to be, as a government, uh, I need to be uh, in control of the situation. We, we've seen the COVID situation is quite fluid. Uh, you, requirements may change any time. You might want to revoke uh, also a, a status. But at the same time, a government don't want to see, doesn't want to, see, uh, to be seen as a police state. Uh, there is a change also in, in our societies about um, uh, where do I... Uh, to who I give my my, my private data, uh, what are they doing with? So um, um, to overcome this, we, we position the government as a certifier of, of the data. So um, it means that the passenger will supply it, well, private information about well, health data uh, to this recognized body uh, who will then give something back. And that's the health pass we are, we are talking about. So um, that's a change of paradigm. It, it's, I, I'm not um, moving with my uh, PCR test result in hand and, and disclosing uh, my birth date or my, my, uh, any sensitive information to anyone. I'm disclosing just the fact that I am approved by that government. And I think that that was um, what really um, helped convincing the, the, the government who we, abs we absolutely needed also the, the government in the, in the equation because they are the certifier, they are the, the approver. Um, and, uh, and, and this is also with the government that ecosystem is, is, is well balanced. Uh, so um, that change of paradigm, paradigm is, is the fact that I supply information to an authority and I got something back. And that's a big change from typical um, uh, electronic travel authorization when you when you submit uh, you know in advance of your of your flight data and you don't really know what's what's going on you you will know what will, will happen uh, when, when you actually cross the border after your flight and something is wrong and, and you realize well, well something was wrong and, and you have that stressful moment until you, you, you see an agent that okay might be some something uh, with my my application so in this model the government replies back with a, a tangible credential. It shows that you are approved, and the li liability is, is also um, put on the government. So um, that, that's that's a reward in a sense uh, to the to, to the passenger, and uh, well, that makes the architecture a bit more difficult to set up. Uh, of course, <laughs> that was interesting to to go uh, through the, the, the journey, um, but it is a way to take into consideration everyone's need, and 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 that was a reward for us in the end. I think Scott, you felt how per, you felt in your role exactly how the governance made the architecture more interesting. Maybe you can talk to us a bit about how governance um, impacted applying business logic to the ecosystem, but also the other way around, how the ecosystem and what we could do with machine-readable governance informed the governance. Yeah, I think that that's a great point. And, and to, to start with um, what Adrian was talking about, the idea of a uh, the, the Aruba government certifying the, the health results and then um, using a, a derived credential um, downline to to still allow 
uh, movement of people and and um, and that can be done because there's trust in the certifying authority and while that sounds a bit centralized it's it's really not because it's just about um, governance it's about managing those relationships between entities so if I'm a restaurant in Aruba and I'm going to accept the government stamp if you will the government credential um, saying that they've checked this person's results um, then, then that's a relationship that already exists, right, between the government and, and, the, and the restaurant. So they're, we're simply allowing them to exercise, um, you know, an exchange of information that, uh, between parties who already have an existing relationship. Um, but to, to go to your question, Heather, so it, it's definitely not a, a one-way street, that, that governance where you, you establish it, lay it down, and it's done. Um, as we started building the ecosystem, we started to realize there were some requirements that, um, you know, that, that we weren't quite aware of, and that's been part of the learning process. Our audience, Aruba, is very, and, and but not deeply entrenched in decentralized identity, right? As I said, they they stood up some really nice digital tools to help manage their problem down there, um, and our goal was to help them make those um, slightly better, uh, quite a bit more trustworthy. And um, and more efficient and scalable than, than it already was. So um, so for me, it, it came down to um, the 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 idea of um, putting data in the hands of the credential holder, which allowed them to. Um, um, I, let me backtrack. Putting data in the hands of the credential holder helped them with their compliance meaning that um, they had requirements from, um, you know, in, internal regulations, um, external influences from, from Holland that said, here's the kind of data you need to keep, here's the kind of data you, you may want to keep, here are the things you need to check, um, here are the GDPR requirements that need to be met. Um, and, and so we were able to take, take all of those different things as they changed and turn them into machine readable governance, right? So that they had that autonomous uh, control of what was going on. And uh, for me, that was eye-opening. It was the idea that, that I, we kind of went into it thinking, um, here are the rules and you can play by them. And they said, well, we have all these other rules that need to apply. And, and what was eye-opening to me was the idea was, was really the ease with which we can take machine readable governance and change it. At, at, at a minute's notice. And so that not only helped them with, with some of their data control issues, um, but it also helped them adapt to the actual pandemic problem of saying, um, today we want a PCR test that's done within 72 hours and perhaps um, next week the science changes and we need to change our, our rules on what's acceptable and what's not. And they can execute that very quickly and easily on their own without having to rely on, um, you know, on other other authorities or other um, call it non-interested parties having to execute that. So in our last three minutes here, one of the surprising things that happened while we we're actually conducting the trial in Aruba was Cardia with Linux Foundation Public Health. And so maybe Adrian, in our last couple minutes, you can talk a bit about the role of Cardia um, and how that how that happened. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. So th th that was really interesting because um, we, um, we we suddenly realized well we, we do have uh, well uh, what we call the reference implementation because um, uh, it uses the open source uh, the code and it solves the problem. So um, let's encourage everyone to uh, to continue to build on top of of this um, uh, of, of this uh, implementation or, or on this standard. So. Um, um, the the idea is now that we, we need well the snowball effect to to ensure you know data is exchanged uh, for the travel industry. It is absolutely absolutely vital that uh, we, we see uh, more and more uh, use cases uh, and, and data exchange on health to so that borders can can reopen. And um, we, we have seen the 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 immense value of decentralized identity in this. Um, we we hope we um, we contribute to the trust framework also. Um, um, determination, and uh, we encourage everyone to uh, to uh, to join Cardia and 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 improve it. Of course, uh, the code is, is open to be uh, to be uh, to be improved, and uh, and everyone can raise their own su suggestions. I mean, we, we do have a, a weekly call, 
uh, and uh, we, we hope uh, that it will uh, well um, boost uh, what we need the, 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 the organization of those ecosystems and build a future proof governance also so um, that's what cardia is, is about is um, is providing an example of um, of what we what, what can be done uh, to solve that real industry problem and, and, and the, the code is uh, is open source too so um, um, again it's not a new thing for the travel industry it's complex uh, complex ecosystems uh, but now i think technology has a real uh, well a bigger role to play for those who are interested in joining and participating in the working group for Cardia, it meets at noon Eastern time on Thursdays. You can go to cardia.app, so that's C-A-R-D-E-A dot A-P-P to learn more information. Um, and as Adrian said, we welcome you all um, in DCO, um, CETA, and several other organizations are leading the effort on Cardia. We're out of time here. I want to thank you, Adrian, and you, Scott, for having this conversation. I want to thank everyone who has joined us. Um, if you'd like to connect with any of us, we're all on LinkedIn. And with that, I want to say thank you and enjoy the rest of your event. Thank you. Thank you, Heather.